Hi there all, welcome to the webinar this morning. Uh, we will be getting started in just a minute, so thank you for all those joining us. We've just got a few more filtering into the session as we speak, so please bear with us just a, just a minute as we let others just find their, find their seats, so to speak, uh, and then we'll get started as well. Thanks very much. Okay, I think we've had a few more filter their way in. So what we'll do, so we'll we'll get started, um, and then you know be able to get getting into the the main interesting parts of today's conversation as well. So hopefully everyone should be able to see my screen okay with the uh, the parent advisory call. So thank you for joining us today. This is um, a sessions we we hold regular sessions like this really with the intent of sharing information and knowledge. Today's session is going to be on looking to assist with gaining an understanding of what your organizations would be able to do with the enterprise mobility and security plus options that are available now under a specialized pricing set for NHS organizations with the, with the current N365. This is ideally looking to provide guidance and assistance with you know kind of your choices that you're making as you run up to the kind of the September time frame for your your commitments to the different licensing options you may choose. So just to introduce for today Today. Uh, we have a few speakers with us. Um, I'll just introduce myself quickly. So Phil Mercer, uh, Managing Director at Power On. I, I tend to be very hands-on though. So I, I, my, my thing is I, I do like to work with customers and I always have a strap line of saying I'm technical but not a techie. So I, I do a lot of work with different organizations across the NHS and otherwise really helping support kind of alignment of where technologies may or may not make sense and, and how's the kind of approaches or practices that you can use to adopt them as well. And then Chris, if you'd like to say hello, yeah, good morning, everybody. My name is Chris Hardis. I'm from Microsoft. I am a security, compliance and identity technical specialist with Microsoft. Great. Thanks, Chris. And Heinrich, if you'd like to say hello as well. Um, hi there. I'm Heinrich. I'm part of the um, solutions team here at Parent Platforms. And my job is just to understand clients' needs and obviously then to help put the relevant steps in place to drive things forward. Brilliant. Thanks very much, Henrik and Chris. Um, so just to give you guys a quick understanding then in terms of what we're looking to cover off today, EMNS Plus essentially, and especially the N365 contract is obviously a very broad topic in, it, in its overarching state. So we're looking to you know, give you a, 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 a kind of a, a high level overview and kind of intention around that EMNS and the Azure AD premium stacks within that. Uh, we'll run through just a quick introduction of the session, just to kind of give you a flavor of, of how these sessions tend to run and just some expectations of that. And then really we'll get into the, uh, the conversation with Chris, providing us a, a summary overview of the N365 and relevant pieces to the EMNS Plus side of things. I'll then kind of give you a bit more of a, an insight on say the particular types of projects that we've seen other NHS customers take advantage of where they may have uh, had previous investments into the EMNS stack uh, and look to try and really give that on a view of one of the, the, the kind of areas of priority as it were relevant to it. And really then what we're looking to do is use that to kind of give you a good set of information to open out into an open Q&A. So just to kind of really set a little bit of the scene in terms of the session itself, these are very very much intended to be informational sessions. So in respect of that, they are driven as well by your good selves. So we have had some previous questions come in prior to the session, which is great, but also really one of the biggest things for this is you'll note that you have a questions option uh, within the actual kind of uh, webinar session. Uh, what we really encourage you to do is if you have questions as we go through the content uh, or just generally speaking that you've, you've looked to come to the session, we're looking to try and gain understanding of, 
please do drop those in there. We will certainly be looking to cover those off in the Q&A and, and then time permitting, we'll get through all of those. If not, we'll certainly make sure all of those questions are picked up and answered and, and responded to in kind, uh, relevant to as we go through. Um, typically speaking, we'll normally save the actual responses to the questions to the actual Q&A element of the, of the session. Uh, however, we may may jump in and out of a few questions just if they're particularly pertinent or, or relevant to add some additional context as we run through. But typically, we'll we'll kind of save those to the Q and A. But would really encourage you to you know kind of um, add those in so we can obviously make this as relevant and informative for your good selves as possible. Um, with respect to the sessions, um, they are open, so these will be also made available to you on demand. Any of the materials and other bits and pieces discussed can also be shared. So please just let us know if there's obviously anything particular that you need. Um, but really, as I say, uh, hopefully this should be a good open informational piece, not looking to kind of use this as any kind of sales aspect. It really is to provide knowledge and guidance out there to the organizations we work and, and don't work with as well. So without further ado, I will pass over to Chris. And Chris, I will just give you control so that you can then drive the slide sets. You should now have that. And let me just check. Great, thank you very much. So, um, again, good morning, everybody. Let me let me just say my role here is is really to talk about N365, about the product, what it is from Microsoft, how it's come about. Um, the options you've got for, for N365 uh, and more what the components are and how they may relate um, to what you've already got in the organization. So what is N365? Well, exactly like it says there, it's a set of agreed prices between Microsoft and NHS. It's to help your transformation to move from on-premise into the cloud. It contains Office 365, so the online subscription for Office services, as well as apps for M enterprise, so it was Office 365 Pro Plus. The driver behind that, of course, is moving from your local office, and it's the modern replacement for Office 2010. It also includes a number of uh, security products, so enterprise mobility and security products, and that's to allow um, your workforce to be able to work remotely, um, which, as we all know, very recently has become incredibly important uh, and has been implemented across the board, and also remove some of the overheads that you might need for that, for the help desk and admin tasks, for password resets and requests to apps and so on, and to get audio comps in through there, through Teams, uh, to allow some of the things that we, we used to have to do on premise and some of the things that we, we used to have to travel to do to take away that requirement within the organization. Um, why now? Well, um, it is a partnership really between Microsoft and the Department of Health. We've been working on this for a while. The first thing is there's an awful lot of trusts out there that have still got Office 2010. And as we know, it goes out of support in October this year. Um, and we're going to move, uh, the NHS itself is going to move to an evergreen product. So uh, the same with Windows 10, the same with servers, um, Office 365 as well. We're looking at an evergreen licensing, an evergreen product that, that rather than looks at this big bang jump um, every five years or in some cases every 10 years or so to the next iteration of the Microsoft product, but to do a gradual evolution of those products to, to take away some of the pain of that jump within there as well. And then particularly important, improving the overall security posture. Um, we know even um, throughout uh, this particular epidemic and, and, and how important the NH is at this time, as it is always, but particularly at this time, there has been attacks on hospitals. There's been major attacks on some um, large hospital trusts in the UK, even though all this is going on, which is quite shocking when you think about it. So uh, an awful lot of this is driven by the need to improve the security posture and to help you work better, work more remotely, but also maintain that security. So I'm about to go into the focus. I'm going to talk about what, what's in the pudding, uh, what's part and parcel uh, of N365. Um, there is a lot that I'm going to mention here. Um, we are limited on time. There will be a Q&A session at the end. Please keep the questions coming through as we're talking as well. As we, we, we go back and forth, we'll endeavor to answer all the questions you've got either at the end 
or we'll, we can follow up afterwards and we can follow up with more conversations on this to go more in depth later if you want to do so. So first off, let's talk about part of the deal. I'm going to mention client access licenses. What do I mean by client access licenses? That's licenses for your uh, system center configuration manager. If you have that, including Microsoft Endpoint Manager, um, which is your ability to dual manage devices, either be on premise or in the cloud. Also licenses for Microsoft Identity Manager for the uh, identity configurations on premise and your uh, client server access licenses as well. So when I mention CALS, that's what I'm talking about there. You will see, hopefully when this moves on. Um, we talk about N365. Uh, you may have heard about the phrase Microsoft 365, so M365. What's the difference? Well, there is no difference. We're, um, it, the N really is, is to stipulate that it's the NHS and what M365 contains is Windows 10 on modern devices, um, Microsoft Apps for Enterprise, so that's Office 365 Pro Plus and Config Manager and Intune. So for N365, M365, read, read the same product but it's a particular deal and pricing scenario for the NHS. Now I'm going to, hopefully when it moves forward, so I'm going to talk about the actual products now. I'm going to try and relate them to what you may have on premises at the moment. Um, probably what you have got on premise on the moment. There are two flavors of this, whether you're in a local tenant or the central tenant. Um, but what I, what I want to try and do is relate to what is you will have going forward to what you've got at the moment. So if we look at the moment on premises, we're looking at um, usually your Active Directory, obviously, Exchange on premises, uh, unstructured file shares. So um, your um, drives, um, your file shares on, on servers on premises that you may have, uh, your browser based line of business apps. So you may have line of business apps that you've created in house um, that you're hosting in house and their access for a browser. Um, devices, how you manage your devices, potentially SCCM, there are other management tools out there, but SCCM if you've got that. And then again, your Citrix, RSH or BDR environments that you may have. We look at the Active Directory uh, in Azure. Okay, so the control plane that we're gonna use to control all this. As I said, there's two flavors. You will either have local or your own Azure Active Directory, or you will become uh, you already are or you will become part of the central uh, tenant in Azure Active Directory. How we connect? Well, with your own, we'd use Azure AD Connect. And for the central tenant, we connect with TanSync or reverse TanSync um, for those people who are using the central tenant. On top of that, we have the Office Suites, the Office products. So we have Office 365 E1. Um, which includes Exchange Online, SharePoint Online, Teams, OneDrive for Business and the Office apps to use online, so through the web browser um, and there are limitations on that. We have Office 365 E3, which is the Exchange Online Plan 2, the SharePoint Online Plan 2, OneDrive for Business with 5 terabyte, but also adds in your compliance features such as data loss prevention and core rediscovery and a basic Office um, message encryption and to go with that we have the microsoft 365 apps so that is office pro plus office 365 pro plus and that is we're talking a local installation on the devices as well as of course being able to use it on the web browser excuse me there is part of this um on the central tenant the office 365 e3 restricted where you would uh, get this as part of the central tenant, and that's NHS mail as we talk about that, the Exchange Online mailboxes, um, the SharePoint Online plan and OneDrive, which are restricted, and there are some features with that. On top of this, for the security aspects, we're looking at the Enterprise Mobility and Security E3, so the basic product, and that contains Azure AD Premium Plan 1, Intune, Azure Information Protection Plan 1 and Microsoft Threat Analytics. I will point out what these are shortly. And the client access licenses that I've mentioned before for anything you've still got remaining on, on premise. And then the EMS E3 Plus, um, that adds Azure AD Premium Plan 2, the components of which I will talk about in a moment. 
So how do these things in the cloud match to what you may have on premise? Well, if we look at it uh, from this side of where your, your web-based uh, apps, the exchange online will move up uh, or take over from your exchange on premises. Your unstructured file shares, first of all, would move to SharePoint. So those file shares you have on servers on premises will move up to SharePoint online. The home drives, the standard user drives you recall would go to OneDrive for businesses. So your users home drive that they may have on premise would then be their OneDrive for business. Your web-based line of apps, again, they move up to be protected and hosted online, protected by Azure AD Premium Plan 1 and Intune. Your management with SCCM would still be there to be able to manage these devices. But then we look at co-management with Intune. So you can manage the devices either on premise, if that's where they are. Let's say, for example, you wish to get a, an update from Microsoft uh, and the device is on premise, then that device would um, go to Config Manager on premise. It would go to the distribution point where the update is and it would get the update from Config Manager rather than going outside to the Internet. But if that device is working remotely, if that device is being used from home, that device would then switch to being managed by Intune. There would be no requirement and it would be foolish for that device to have to remote back into the organization to get a, an update or a patch from Microsoft when it can just go direct to Microsoft and get that patch as well. So that's where we end up with a co-managed situation between there. Um, Azure Information Protection Plan 1 will start um, protecting and managing your file shares. So you'd start applying labels and security and permissions and controls on those files you have within the organization. Uh, threat analytics, running over your Active Directory on-premise as well as your Azure Active Directory to, to maintain a, a good oversight on any threats that may be occurring. And your Azure AD Premium, Plan 2, if you was to have the Plan 2, would supplement your Plan 1 and give you further controls over your environment. And we can look at what those controls are because I want to go for this. We've mentioned that I'm moving up from there. I've mentioned the client access license that you get, but the threat analytics, um, that would give you user entity and behavioral analytics. An example of that may be... Um, a standard admin user who comes in, we all tend to be creatures of habit. We come in at eight o'clock in the morning. The first thing an admin might do is he'd log on to his server. Um, he'd have a look at alerts. He'd, he'd check the email. We're creatures of habits. If all of a sudden this admin starts trying to log on to um, a domain controller at five o'clock in the morning and attempts it three or four times, then behavioral analytics looks at the patterns and sees that's, in, that's not the type of thing that would normally happen and alerts generated. Azure Information Protection, uh, your P1 gives you AIP scanner, but discovery only. What does that do? Azure Information Protection Scanner, you determine what a um, type of file is. So for example, a financial document, you determine what the criteria of a financial document is, and then scanner will r run through your environment and look for all the files that match that criteria. You've got an office message encryption as well as Windows information protection, um, Azure rights management service and classification and labeling. This is where when you find those files or you've got those files and some of them are, are, are sensitive, some of them are financial, you can start applying labels to those to put controls on those labels as well, as well as retention labels to determine how long you keep them and so on. Um, within Tune, there's the option for autopilot. Um, autopilot very much for, for the local tenant, so we're moving away from building devices and having a core build and so on, and we can build devices outside the organization remotely if that's required. We have device-based conditional access, so depending who the user is, where the user is, and what the user um, is trying to access, we can determine, if you like, how many hoops they have to jump through to get um, through to that data. So um, a contract worker who wishes to look at their shifts would have to look go through less security measures than your chief financial officer who wishes to look at your budgetary requirements. 
Um, we've got to talk about Endpoint Manager, SCCM and Intune working together. It also works with mobile application management for those who've got just an, uh, in the cloud licenses to make sure they don't download documents they shouldn't do um, and they can run those applications from any device and mobile device as well management. With Active Directory uh, Premium Pre-1, third party application single sign-on. So we single sign on to everything as well. The user gets the device. Hopefully, we're moving away from passwords to biometrics. The user signs on to the device and they sign on once. And that authentication is carried through to any applications that may need to use the Active Directory application proxy, where your user can go to an application and you can push it through to a CASB so you can apply further restrictions on there and monitoring. Conditional access of man mentioned, password protection, self-service capabilities and multi-factor authentication the most singular important thing to turn on as soon as you can and then we go to on azure active directory p2 when we talk at p2 that's overlaid on top of those and it's some of the higher level security features that you may want identity protection entitlement management and access reviews who's getting access to what and for how long and when we revoke it as well as privileged identity management so we can make sure that those with the keys to the kingdom, if you like, have only got the keys to the kingdom for the shortest amount of time. And at other times that account that has all that power is dormant. Um, so it can't be taken over with say, uh, Mimikatz or uh, other such threats that can use that account for an attack. So that's a summary in total of all the products. And I do realize it's quite a, a whiz through on the summary there, but there's a lot to talk about. More than happy to go through this at a later date in more depth, if that's what you require and answer any questions on it. But that's what N365 is, and that's the products included on there. Uh, again, if there's any questions, please raise them at the end or put them in the chat window, and I will hand you back now. Thank you, Chris. So let me just pick up from there. So. Yeah, so what we'll then just go into, because as Chris said as well, you know, the reality with this is there's an awful lot of potential provided under the N365 contract for you as well. And even with the session today where we're looking at the EMNS and the AAD P2 side, so we're not really looking at the Office 365 elements in terms of your SharePoints and your extended components there, but looking at the management security arena, there's still an awful lot of capabilities for you. So, you know, what we're looking to try now is to kind of give insight into where we've seen kind of say key initiatives or, or kind of um, you know projects capabilities delivered and by by different trusts or different NHS organizations to really start to access and use these so we're not going to go necessarily exhaustively across the full EMS and, and equally there's there's relevance to that in terms of where normally speaking um, there is priorities in terms of where you will access one of the pieces I have done within this as well is because we've seen with other NHS colleagues that they've um, been in the process now really of looking to justify what elements they're looking to adopt from the N365 contract. I have included some estimated kind of budgetary elements for you to have these services deployed. Um, but as I say, I want to stress that that's purely to help uh, really give you guidance and information if you are going through the budgetary process. I was always conscious of that because it can always come off a little bit too salesy. That's the, the intent here is really to help with some of your your considerations of what type of projects you might prioritize and the, and the kind of budgets and other things you need to kind of consider with that. So with that being said, there's essentially a number of kind of work streams that you probably consider when you start to look at the EMS. I'm not going to go through laboriously as, um, with this as well. And, and Chris has given a good overview of a number of the moving parts. But essentially, these would all represent a couple of the key type of items that you would do. Um, it's highlighted to the right what kind of licenses. Essentially, anything that's not in blue is under what would traditionally be EMS. A key aspect relevant to the N365 contract, though, is normally Azure AD Premium P2 is a separated purchase option within it or an, or an extended part that you might if you get into the E5 components of the licensing. But within the N365 contract, the, there is a special bundle, as it were, 
where EM and SE3 and AADP2 are together. So when you buy that, you, you must buy both uh, under the N365 contract. So we've incorporated all of that together with this. Um, you know, a couple of the key things that typically speaking where customers most spend their focus on really sit around that kind of identity and access management stream and also the kind of managed mobile productivity. You know, with the kind of common aspects that you'd start to see is around bringing in additional layers of security for management of access with MFA and other moving parts, but also really around you know especially in the kind of current climb is around how you get control of your devices whether they be windows 7 even still and, and moving those out from 7 to 10 as you know some of us are still working through that process but also of course how you're really then bringing in that windows 10 management and and really kind of looking to bring kind of that secure remote management of devices and applications and services uh, across the board one point of note that is um you know relevant and key key with all of this and, and chris has touched you know on that kind of definitively as well with that kind of differential between as i'm sure you're all aware the local um tenant option or the central tenant option um, a point of note for it is that the capabilities that we'll run through um, are absolutely all fully available for the local tenancy, um, but at the moment, and, and, and Chris can add context as well, the informational side is that Accenture are working through exactly how the administrative and um, capabilities will be provided for the central tenant. So there is no definitive statement on what possible limitations may be present um but if i was to you know kind of take a a view um an unofficial view i will say uh, essentially based on experience of working with this and other pieces especially when you have essential tenants you, you you should likely expect certain limitations to be present when it is confirmed um, they will mainly sit around the ability to integrate systems between each other due to the due to the multi-tenant and the and the large single central tenant so decisions need to be made at a central governance level in in that case for integrations um, and additionally the kind of the full level levels of administrative access you may have, i.e. there may be certain restrictions on the on the level of administrative control that you may get under the central tenant. As I say, that is an unofficial statement and technically speaking at the moment Accenture have, have, have made statements that they're, they're going to be providing a interface to be able to support and cooperate that administrative access to it, but it's just a, a point of note and, and consideration that the, the likely will be some some limitations present, uh, but those are not defined as yet. I don't know whether Chris, you feel that's uh, anything you want to add to that. I appreciate it's a, it's a bit of a question to be answered um, yet still. It is a question to be answered, but, but exactly like you say, there are some controls within a tenant that if you were to change them would affect everybody within that tenant you obviously will not be able to affect those controls within the central tenant. That, that exactly like I said, that there, there will be limitations because there has to be. There are a number of controls that would, infect, uh, would affect the entire tenant and that will be kept to central control. What level of other access controls and role-based access control you have is still to be determined, but there will obviously be some limitations. Cool, great. Um, so just then jumping into the kinds of elements that we would see as initiatives and and as I say ideally this is provided to to give some awareness um, so the intention with this is to kind of give you an idea of these are the kinds of projects that you would likely be adding to your agenda um, should you move forward with say an EMNS um, and security package within the within the site interestingly that being said the first one on the list is actually also related to your Windows 10 contract that is already existingly in place through the NHS national contract side of things as well. Um, it's relevant in terms of this because it's kind of tied in with the identity and the access management side. There are also ways and options that it can be um, expanded by the level usage of Azure AD premium capabilities. So essentially what we're talking around here is one of the most common ones that are, we're seeing within uh, within trust organizations, within NHS orgs, is really looking to kind of shift across to uh, Microsoft's kind of core native um, VPN capabilities. Uh, those are licensed under the national contract. You would essentially be able to then deliver a, a infrastructure-based VPN. So effectively what I mean by that is you don't necessarily need to go 
run by um, external VPN endpoints or additional uh, infrastructure relevant to it, you can leverage your existing infrastructure that you have available to you. So that can be uh, quite beneficial in terms of you know how your abilities deploy it. Uh, also, because obviously all the licensing aspects are covered within it, that, that allows you to kind of consider how you might be able to reduce and the capabilities are really quite strong from a VPN service. This is an evolution from pre-existing solutions under say direct access for those that are familiar with direct access and it works on a capability of both giving you an ability to manage the device through a, a device-based tunnel as well as then user kind of specific elements in terms of a user-based tunnel so that means that you can do remote management devices you know in a, on a more controlled basis it gives you ability to have quite granular control of what user accessibility is and also one of the most common things that you'll tend to start to see is just that ability to be able to then kind of scale and load and, and really kind of build that out quite quickly uh, in terms of, of the ability just to add additional virtual machines to expand your capacity for the VPN service. So it does make it a very scalable solution, you know, relevant to NHS orgs. Uh, and also it's quite good because it's because it's a native VPN, you know, compliance in with elements like NCSC and certainly the kind of the national standards as well as into things like Cyber Essentials and, and Cyber Essentials Plus. Um, they're all, you know, kind of very much tick boxed uh, relevant to then that kind of VPN solution for you. Um, one thing that mentioned there with the context of kind of relational to the EMS side, one of the most common questions that you tend to get asked within a, a VPN implementation is the consideration around multi-factor authentication. So with this being a Microsoft service integrated natively into Windows 10, you can then extend the um, control plane to be able to use the Microsoft multi-factor authentication service for Azure AD Premium P2. So that can certainly then deliver that capability for you. However, one thing that we would certainly say is that that is typically the, one of the most common requests when you start to look at um, the VPN services. But the nice thing around the way the Microsoft service will work is most security managers, once the you know detail is, is discovered, are actually pretty comfortable with the native um, operating motion in terms of the, the factors of security. The reason why I say that is you have both the user credentials as a, essentially a, a factor of access, but also the device itself leveraging a certificate on the device, uh, which actually essentially acts as your then second factor of authentication. Uh, and with using that more just, just standard native in terms of the, the two factor or one and a half factor dependent on some perspectives, um, it actually just can keeps that really nice, transparent, kind of simple user VPN um, service available to you. But you can expand this with using Azure AD Premium P2, uh, P1, sorry, with the multi-factor authentication capabilities. One, one element that the, the really then start to come together in terms of multiple steps that actually are very quick to, relatively speaking, implement would be both the actual setup of MFA and also the setup of self-service password reset. A bit of a combination of capabilities there uh, in terms of having some dependencies on each other. So the MFA service, you know, technically speaking, really would have a bit of a dependency and also having conditional access in place. But the MFA side gives you uh, one of the most most recommended elements to improve your cybersecurity posture, essentially giving you that ability to be able to create a challenge based on either certain conditions or just generally speaking in terms of where access needs to have an extra element elevated level of control, or also just generally speaking, depending on your perspective relevant to MFA. Um, quite simple to set up, is managed through the Azure AD side, so it is cloud orientated to certainly be able to cover quickly into any of the Microsoft services, but also can be extended to kind of connect with different ways of presentation of uh, access. Um, so you can then really make sure that you've got that. MFA also is a really nice service in terms of both using the biometric capabilities, depending on the device type that you're using to support or integrate into the app or the phone call or text message typical type of motions in terms of actually leveraging the MFA side so quite quick and and certainly easy to do you can do some extended options with the MFA uh, that would be the ability to deploy some uh, on-premise infrastructure and other bits if you want to tie in with certain say internal web applications uh, more directly but more commonly there's alternative ways of delivering those services that you can then just use the standard MFA cloud orientated service as well but there are some custom specialized options that you can do with the MSA service if you need but to be quite honest with you we we haven't probably done that for an NHS organization now for 
almost two years, I would say. Uh, it was a little bit more acquired a bit ago when there was a bit more dependency on some of the internal aspects with that. But with the with the options around something that is additionally available under Azure AD Premium, which is something called um, Remote App Proxy or a JD app proxy. Um, essentially, that allows you to present internal web services uh, externally and then apply those same native MFA controls, conditional access controls, and other elements you get within Azure AD Premium as well. Um, Self-serviced password reset, relatively, I suppose, self-explanatory, uh, self uh, but a very quick service to be able to set up and, you know, typically very strong benefit. Uh, normally speaking, the, the kind of the time is minimal, but you can go through testing and other bits and pieces relevant to how you would actually go through. You will want to have the MFA set up just so that you can then, again, do certain enforcement depending on the request location for the for the reset. Um, but you can have that nat natively integrated into the, to the Gina, as it were, in terms of the Windows 10 log on screens, or you can have it as a service access through web, phone, or other, other mechanisms in terms of, of how you can support that. A part that's becoming a, a bit more common, though, what you tend to see is you have a range of solutions within the NHS that currently deliver these types of services is set up a single sign-on. So, you know, very commonly in Pravata and other kind of capabilities are present. So one that is variable in its level of, of usage currently, given the, the alternative solutions that tend to exist um, and that already existing work you may have done to integrate with smart card access and other bits and pieces there. But certainly something that is is you know kind of a, a growing option and certainly provides some you know very good options in terms of how you can use this so whether you either do it selectively for certain key applications that set outside of common or you want to more bring it more holistically across certain standardized services essentially you can deliver you know a, a, a kind of a, an enterprise single sign-on solution through Azure AD premium uh, that natively works pretty much out of the box with a with a wide range of um, standard apps. So you know the usual things are always Twitter and other bits and pieces. But of course, you know there's a there's a range of applications that you can you can get going with very quickly. It's very simple to add single sign-on to kind of web-based applications as well um, in terms of being able to actually configure and do those. And so it can be very easy to be able to kind of get going with this and really start to kind of get a good level of of management support and reduce down a lot of the password complexity or the password management controls that you need to do for certain applications across the business. Um, with respect of the actual options to extend this, single sign-on, as I say, natively will be very quick to get going with. But you can, though, have this uh, integrate with a wide range of then custom scenarios. Uh, as it is, it is able to support against a lot of the different authentication protocols. The the, the primary kind of considerations we're starting to again go for, say, custom line of business or other kind of standard apps is is considerations around making sure that it's a a SAML or an OAuth essentially supported application, so you can work through the integration to that. Um, I'll note as well that the costs on some of these are uh, again variable to kind of give budgetary estimates. You can do it in in quicker periods, but it's it's if you were going through design planning, you know, training and other bits and pieces. Um, but like anything with these, single sign-on can be set up very quickly. But typically speaking, customers start to target in on some of those kind of more custom line of business where you just do need to consider. Uh, exactly how you're going to then just do that integration and authentication side as well. Uh, but as I say, one piece to consider with this is it, it would be typically starting to either look to complement something like, say, an existing Improvata capability or potentially longer term as maybe something to replace. I wouldn't necessarily say that you would use it to replace immediately, uh, as that wouldn't realistically uh, probably work given investments and the integrations with smart cards and other items that you tend to have uh, with some of the existing solutions solutions that are within the NHS today. Um, the last two elements that would really be kind of the ones most commonly really pushed uh, and, and delivered within um, the Agenda and Access space would be starting to, to, to absolutely set up conditional access. To be honest, this, uh, as is noted as dependencies on previous is, is one of the first you would do. One of the nice elements though with the N365 contract is you have the expanded capability with the Azure AD Premium P2 option to also introduce the idea of risk-based controls. So this is then more intelligent information provided by the Microsoft Intelligence Security um, you know, kind of feedbacking and really enabling you to go beyond 
uh, the kind of the core standard, which is still a, a, a strong capability where you can use it based on location, based on device, based on user, um, you know, and, and, and other, other elements there. Um, it's really starting to then consider to say, actually, we've, we've rated this IP as a risky IP what kind of action would you like to take on that? Would you like to say that because this is rated as a risky location done by Microsoft, so, you, so typically locations are either trusted or untrusted um, in the conditional access set, you can get that kind of intelligent feedback um, to your side to be able to actually say, if we identify this as a risky IP location or a risky location to log in from, we want it to do a MFA challenge, for example. Or you can say, if it is a classified as a high risk, just, just block sign in completely so that the user won't be able to access from those locations. Always considerations, of course, to give in terms of the allocations of your policy, but definitely useful. So quite quick to set up. The, the risk-based profiles are also relatively easy to integrate, just need a little bit more consideration in terms of the severity that you put down for the risk-based access, uh, but really gives you a, a great way then, especially with this kind of strong move towards the provision of cloud-based access and services, um, a control plane across all of those in terms of how you can monitor and manage the scenarios by which your users can gain access to your different services. One that has been used um, across a wide range of IT elements of the organization is, is typically the privileged identity management for cloud services. I mentioned the IT specifically because it is an Azure AD premium piece. Uh, and it could be quite common that you know, um, organizations would potentially buy that specifically for the IT administrators. One of the biggest reasons for that and relevant to what we're talking around here is the ability to bring in then um, the kind of the, the just in time or just enough management of access. So really trying to get away from this idea of having, you know, a large number, shall we say, depending on orgs, but certainly a varied number of, of, of global admins are in a permanent state. You know, we want to really kind of look to kind of reduce the level of potential attack surface that, uh, you know, kind of threats can come in from, and also really just kind of give ourselves a much better control um, in terms of the actual level of administrative management needs that are that are present within, within the organization as well. So privileged identity management, uh, it comes with a wide range of pre-configured administrative roles available to you. Uh, you can create some custom roles if you need, but to be honest with you, there's a lot in, in, of standard roles available that you can leverage, and, and it's far beyond just the global admin. So you can have anything from simple kind of user administrator to you know kind of the full global admin service and, and lots of different pieces in between. Um, but essentially, you can enable yourselves then to set up a access control policy which can vary in terms of being able to say, these users are permanently assigned the actual role, but you're, you're able to monitor and audit their usage. Um, you can have elements where it needs to be just um, pre-approved. So essentially they still need to activate the role, but there's no next levels of approval. Uh, you can have it then where it actually has to be uh, essentially authorized, where then that goes through and essentially requires an additional authorizing party to enable that role. You can additionally put elements like MFA on this as well, you know, depending on the level of control. So if it's a global admin, we want to challenge them for MFA and require an actual approver to review and approve this. Uh, but it gives you then a lot of control in terms of that. You can have variances in terms of whether you give this for uh, an hour to 72 hours essentially relevant to the actual kind of time permissions um, and again gives you that auditable trail of, of how that's being used so that that's a really good capability that can be brought in quite easily uh, and then just gives you a lot more confidence that your admin privileges are under control within the kind of cloud services and management that you're you're introducing as part of this as well so certainly that's something that's very good uh, in terms of introducing when we move into the managed mobile productivity side, um, one of the ones that is very quickly, you know, kind of really started to be adopted now, this varies a little bit in terms of the range of different NHS organizations, because some NHS organizations have been, say, um, blocked or, or unable to adopt, say, a configuration manager due to licensing restrictions. Um, but this, you know, we take an assumption that you, you 
either have or will look to implement Configuration Manager uh, if you so decide. You are now able to do that under the N365 contract if you subscribe to the EMS C3. One of the really great ones that people are adding into the mix is the ability to establish internet-based management via config. So this is leveraging something called a, a cloud management gateway. And typically speaking, this is used for kind of management then of devices off network. So extending your existing config to actually manage those device, uh, devices on the move. Um, relatively easy to set up. There's uh, some Azure work and some Azure uh, resources that are needed. Typically speaking, with a bit of high availability, you're looking at probably running about 150 to say 200 pounds per month in Azure for that. So, so not high costs but um certainly kind of a level of cost there to to consider but compared to alternative mechanisms a very cost effective solution for that and it really then kind of again brings that ability to extend your management beyond your network boundaries so something traditionally that has been very onerous previously in, in earlier editions. So I go back to the original internet-based management that you used to have in config, but in, mod, in, in recent times with the invent of the, the cloud management gateway, a great addition and, and something again, quite quick to be able to enable and set up. One of the really nice pieces about this is for those that are still say looking to move through the seven to 10 and you have challenges around your devices being all over, um, relatively speaking, um, then not only can this deploy software and patches, it can deploy also out the actual task sequences to effectively implement a 7 to 10 migration as well so this does give you the ability to start to think about how you can scale your migration deployments via that kind of internet-based approach if you have users at home or in various locations that are non-standard uh, for how you'd have been managing this previously so something that certainly could be quite interesting um, kind of bringing the next three almost together, really. Um, so the the elements of this is really around then the ability to adopt Intune in various manners. Uh, you know, this kind of either covers off from the idea of of if you are an existing configuration manager user, how you bring that together into the co-management state, uh, or kind of talking to this now in in Microsoft's new. Uh, language and terminology to it in terms of it as a as part of the Microsoft Endpoint Manager solution. Um, relatively speaking, to provide the initial co-management integration, it's quite simple. Uh, but what that allows you to then do is start to be able to have data flow and, and control across both your kind of core primary devices, but also mobile devices through a, essentially a single control interface. Um, there are still administrative tasks that you'd perform in each, uh, but the co-management allows you to then have that broad kind of ideal of moving towards that kind of more single single orientated management solution and gives control across technically servers if you're licensed for it, but in the context of N365, control across your mobile devices and your primary kind of user devices as well. Um, this can then enable and integrate into a lot of the new kind of co-management, um, a modern management scenario, sorry. So Intune is a prerequisite to start to use elements like autopilot. Um, and then that gives you a range of nice options as well around how you can really speed up and prepare devices as they go out when you think about the Intune in typically its most common usage uh, within NHS organizations, though this is evolving, it is when we start to think around that ability to move to it as your kind of core mobile device management or kind of mobile application management control mechanism. Um, so it's very much an enterprise solution for mobile device control. It kind of gives you that ability to kind of ensure that your devices are complying with the NCSC mobile security standards um, and really kind of that broad capability in terms of management controls for what the devices can do. Um, so what you would expect essentially from, you know, an MDM provider uh, and really kind of gives you a, a very nice capability set across that. Um, it does also have some very nice ways of being able to tie in with user and corporate and personal profiles. So it can certainly kind of give some good options. That aspect is really expanded when you start to think about this in terms of MAM. Um, so we talked about MAM for core Microsoft apps. That's typically the most a common starting place uh, for customer organizations with leveraging Intune. You can very quickly introduce a kind of data control across any application usage on both corporately owned, but also really importantly, non-corporately owned or non-corporately managed devices. Traditionally, it's been problematic to introduce MAM within other solutions due to the fact you had to fully enroll the device. That's got various challenges, whether NHS are working with, say, 
partners um, that essentially have alternative MDMs currently on the device, or whether it's a personal device for one of their one of their staff, and then you get the usual aspects of well, I don't want corporate management on my personal device, and and the range of pieces there. Um, when you're setting up the MAM policies. You can then have those targeted either to a corporately managed device, of course, but you can also do it just to say any user that enrolls that application for corporate access. And so they, they tend to be uh, referred to as enlightened apps. And you can do this across a, a range of applications, but certainly the most common ones would be the, the core Microsoft things. So we think about Outlook as being your most common as, aspect, OneDrive and some of the SharePoint and Teams aspects as well. Then, then you can effectively allow those users to access from a, a wide range of devices, but ensure that anything for that application, but also anything for that application that is corporately orientated is protected and controlled for yourselves. So normally a very good project that gives you a wide range of um, supporting options and really helps again, provide that broader access to remote services and, and also help simplify some of your HR and IT fair usage policies, which is always a bit of a bonus, um, with, of course, complying in with the different kind of needs that you have within aspects like cyber essentials and the different kind of um, ISO and other guidelines, depending on what, whether you know, those kind of priority uh, standards are something that your teams are working towards or have already. Just then kind of closing out the, the managed mobile thread productivity and the main pieces that we would kind of see as some of the kind of key pieces that you would probably work to first. Um, Intune is though, as I say, evolving. Um, now we've seen a growing trend within the NHS organizations to look towards trying to use Intune as its primary management tool. So uh, potentially just removing configuration manager entirely or reducing the dependency on configuration manager within the environment. Um, now that is absolutely possible. Um, so I would say that you, the consideration would be is that Intune for Windows 10 management is what I would refer to as a modern management tool for it. Um, so it's not going to work the same way as you'll be used to if you're used to configuration manager, or to be honest with you, the same way as if you're used to alternative management tools in that, say, more traditional enterprise um, IT management stack. Uh, but what you can certainly do is it has the ability to provision new devices. It won't work on Windows 7. So this is a Windows 10 only op opportunity, but really that's obviously where we should be all be aiming to be at. Um, but it does allow you to kind of deploy software, deploy patches. The, there's different considerations though in terms of how this works. So one of the greatest things I would stress when looking to adopt Intune is that it will require some new ways of thinking if you look to adopt it as your sole management tool for for kind of um, controller windows 10 it will also have certain limitations in terms of the granularity of your control so what i mean by that is if you're used to config you can have a very kind of detailed control of what apps you push in what order and how they're applied and when they're pushed and all this kind of good stuff intune has less um specificity if you will or less ability to be deliberately controlled as to when they will go they'll, they'll deploy the software or just deploy it in a less in a less orientated order and and less specific timings should we say um, but it has the absolute capabilities to manage and deploy that we actually use that to manage certain um, corporate enterprises as well as we've been implementing that for a number of nhs customers as well so it is it is possible but you just must take it with a with a with a consideration that it won't work the way it has is probably the biggest point that I'm trying to make with in respect of that. The nice slides though is, you know, Microsoft have provided an NHSD with some of the configuration sets, uh, certainly ways that you can speed up your readiness to be able to do that uh, and meet again, things like the NCSC standards and guidelines for it. Where we start to see really adopting more of the modern management and modern deployment capabilities is where you look towards kind of moving into the autopilot as well as starting to adopt more kind of modern security policies. Um, autopilot has, has had a bit of a a bit of a varied level of understanding or, or kind of um, you know kind of expectation set because traditionally it's been viewed as very much something that you buy and it can just enable you to build devices remotely wherever you want. That that hasn't been the case and still technically is not the case as we move today. 
So actually there's some preview capabilities coming through for it. But where we see Autopilot really effectively used, and this does have a requirement on Intune and Azure AD Premium, is to really help you speed up your build and provisioning methods for how you're delivering devices out to users. So although you might not just be able to say, buy the device from the shop and it will automatically enroll, unless you're a pure Azure AD house and, and pretty much no NHS organization is, so there's, there's still a lot of dependencies on, a, on an internal on-premise AD then what you can absolutely do is, is both simplify the way the device is provisioned. So you can make sure that actually autopilot can set up. It requires less intervention from your engineer who is initially prepping the device. It also makes the initial onboarding experience cleaner, simpler, and a much nicer way that actually that first first log on the side for the out of the box experience that your users get is is optimized and improved as well so it's a great addition to it it has also the nice capabilities around managing if you say needed to do a reset or a reprovision of the device uh, which can really help the way operationally when you're starting to then consider like movement of devices within the organization, needing to say IT troubleshoot, and actually once it's going past the usual rule of thumb of taking more than 45 minutes to fix it, you can just do a, an autopilot reset to bring it back to a clean, fresh, stable position that the device is known to be working at. So there's some great additions capabilities to that for the immediacy, um, both for standard autopilot capabilities and also something called white glove. Um, White Glove essentially is an improved uh, autopilot build experience um, to slightly simplify it. It does have a dependency though on the device being on a minimum of 1909 uh, from a Windows 10 perspective. I mentioned though that there's actually something new coming through. Now this is the ability to do a hybrid join with um, via a VPN supported service, such as always on VPN. Um, currently speaking, this is a preview capability for the autopilot service, but that will start to see us then opening that door towards what some of the original understandings and expectations may have been presented as. So that now ability to say, yes, you can ship a device just more easily to a client, uh, to an end user and enable them to be able to kind of get on and get working in a, in a less dependent sense of having to go through the traditional um, on-prem deployment and management and other bits with the, the with the required domain controller visibility directly from the device. But that is pretty, um, but something that's definitely worth keeping an eye on uh, and keeping awareness of as well. Where we do start to look though in terms of one of the final pieces on this is, is thinking about that GPO policy. So traditionally of course we've all loved and hated GPOs probably and, and normally have thousands of them in some respects scattered out throughout the last 10-15 years of, of GPO configuration depending on your, your hygiene and management processes um, within respect to those. One of the pieces with the cloud adoption that is obviously at full tilt with the investments in N365 and other contracts is starting to consider how you start to shift your mindset to move into more modern security policies. There's a range of different types that exist within respect of that, um, but essentially you can really now uh, either start to consider it as how are you managing with your Windows 10 as a primary and starting to really reduce the reliance on GPOs? Um, it can be a very good exercise. There's some great tools from Microsoft to assist with the assessment process, though it does require some investment in time to think about which ones you need to bring through and, and how you consider those. Um, but you can, you can pretty much give a, a wide range of support for what would have been traditionally GPO managed. The, the, some of the main reasons for doing this is to start to remove your dependencies on traditional management infrastructure so that you can really start to move towards that modern cloud orientated position and, and remove some of the limitations in, and, and constraints you would then have for adopting that style. And GPOs could be one of the pieces that is part of that puzzle in terms of, uh, in terms of addressing. Uh, some of the nice sides, because they are moving to security baselines, you also get a higher level of reliability versus traditional GPOs, just due to the way that they're distributed and, and not the, necessarily some of the same propagation challenges or deployment timings challenges that you may have got uh, in a previous side. So appreciate just run through a ton of information. There's just some options, just wanted to give you a view that 
these aren't necessarily included within your EMNS E3, but some of the elements that you would start to think about um, as you move through, some that are would be elements such as the implementation of, say, the on-premise identity threat monitoring. So this is actually under the uh, advanced threat analytics. It can be a nice service, nice capability. It hasn't been widely adopted, um, not necessarily because the product isn't capable. It's actually an incredibly strong product, but it's just more of considerations around how it might fit into, say, any of your SecOps um, type of type of behavior. Um, there is now a, a newer variant, but it's an E5 um, consideration, which is the Azure ACP service, which essentially takes a lot of the idea, the ATA capabilities, moves into a cloud service, but it does also bring additional capabilities around integration with cloud app security, Azure Sentinel. Uh, and, and is, of course, the, the area where more investment will be for later product development. But that does have a licensing uplift consideration. Um, Microsoft Cloud App Security is certainly a popular one. It is an E5, um, so it's one of those that is, does will need to be considered from an investment side. Um, but certainly then brings you, especially with an increased profile of using cloud services, it brings you the ability to start to provide better enforcement of policies and management controls uh, and, and also levels of administrative uh, access and, and control as well into certain cloud applications. So that can be certainly a very good one. One that I would have highlighted, and I think for me, you know, if you're, as you're moving through this consideration of what you invest into within the N365 contracts, this is something that is an E5 or a specific capability that you would purchase into. Um, but I would say is one of the best things for you to consider in terms of both its ease to implement and also its effect in terms of protecting organizations from threats, which is essentially the use of Office 365 ATP Plan 2. Um, so this is a great set of technologies and capabilities that will be offered. Uh, this essentially is enabling you to really kind of provide core protection for ransomware for your, and user targeted threats. But the, the reason why I, I would personally have the bias of saying that this is one of the best things that you can you can put in quickly is it is a, a very easy solution to initially get going with. There's, of course, lots of, you know, kind of wizardry and wonder, and, and wonder that you can do with it. But fundamentally, two of its primary um, functional capabilities under the plan two is something called safe links and safe attachments. These essentially will enable you to bring a lot of inherent security to your services. So, you know, emails kind of coming through to your to your users, essentially any links go via a Microsoft proxy, which just kind of gives you a level of, 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 of protection and support to ensure that any links aren't essentially malicious. And equally, any attachments that are coming through will be pre-scanned and, and quarantined if identified as potentially risky. Uh, as also increases enhanced policy controls around potential phishing and again, kind of essentially isolating and quarantining emails that users can and review for approval, uh, but kind of gives a, a good visibility into that in terms of management. So a very good one to consider. Uh, it does require additional licensing commitments, and I've said that several times now, but it's it's a it's a really good one to look at. You don't necessarily have to buy the full E5 package. You can buy just either the plan two or consider the security package that is a additional optional add-ons, uh, but a great one to, to look at. Uh, and then just as a final point of note, again, something that isn't widely adopted with the NHS um, due to various reasons, to be honest with you, but um, the information protection or providing that kind of persistent document protection is certainly something that is potential. I think the biggest things to consider with this, and, and one of the points of note we made on here, is that you do get the core protection and technical capabilities under um, the main ATP Plan 1, um, but effectively if it, under the Plan 2, you gain improved security and, and, and support through the automatic enforcement of your information security policies. I'll try not to labor anymore because I've gone on far too long relevant to kind of giving information, but just really then the final point before Q&A would be um, there's a lot of new capabilities coming through in the contracts. I think one thing that I would heavily consider, um, encourage all of you to do is make sure that when you've planned any investments into this, do plan some considerations for training of your staff and teams. Uh, there's some, there's some very much some support from Microsoft for this, um, but <clears throat> also consider that both from a technical aspect, but also some, some of the architectural and technical leadership in terms of thinking about this now in that new modern kind of cloud service deployment and operational management side. So without further ado, because um, I've certainly gone over relevant to what I was meant to, but hopefully that gives a, a pretty broad set of information to a lot of the common projects that you would see most commonly adopted for the EMS. We'll go into some Q&A.
So I think we have a few good few questions through. So let's just grab a couple of those and open those out to the group as well. Um, so one question was for, is the single sign-on only for AD or Microsoft products, or will it work with other OSs, etc.? So Chris, you, I know you're going to give an initial answer to that. Do you want to just expand on that for the group? or? Um, yeah, that's fine. Uh, so single sign-on can be passed through to, so we can onboard apps within Azure AD, and you can use single sign-on to pass through to that app so we can we can get through the process of, of the user um, doing the one-time sign-on, as I said, hopefully not with the password, the move is to move away from passwords, do a one-time sign-on with, with um, Windows Hello for Business, if it's a Windows device, and, and then we can do the single sign-on, they don't have to do it again to go through whatever app that may be. Though I appreciate there are some applications within the NHS in particular that may be um, absolutely specific to that trust uh, and, and that would be addressed I think on a case-by-case -case basis. Great, thank you for that. And, and now one question, I know we, we could do to a degree, um, but does the ability to do this depend on having your own tenancy? Or, and if so, what can you do with the shared tenancy? Um, so that's a great question. I know we touched on it to a, to a, to a, a level within respect to when we were covering off. Now, the, all of these capabilities are technically available under both services. Um, the, the considerations for the shared tenancy will be what restrictions or limitations may be present when using those. Um, Chris touched on it, on the idea that, you know, effectively there are certain elements within these that if you made a change, it will affect every user within the tenancy. Um, and when in a central tenant, those will need to be centrally controlled and governed, which will mean that your individual ability to influence those will be restricted. And that is really the primary um, kind of area to consider or, or, or be aware of. Now, the absolute specifics of what that means is, is still un, unanswered, uh, as that is um, waiting for additional feedback, essentially, from Accenture uh, and, and, and Microsoft relevant to it. But that's something that Accenture is, is working towards around giving a interface, um, but it is it is not a... It, it is not a definitive answer as yet, as that has not been officially confirmed by the providers. But uh, go on, Chris. Sorry. Yeah, sorry. And I, I think I was going to say, as I said, there are some things that we can definitively say now you won't be able to affect, such as the MDM authority, uh, the Apple MDM push certificate, the Google Play account, manage Google Play account. They are, um, and there are some more, they are tenant wide and have an impact thusly. Yeah, and and that that kind of effectively view will be relevant to across all the essential services. Um, and this is where I, uh, I mentioned on some of the integrations. It's like some of the services have options to integrate with other components, um, but again, that will potentially have a, a consideration for the whole group, which will then realistically mean. Uh, restrictions will be applied or potential limitations for that. Um, so appreciate it's not. Uh, a clear answer um, but unfortunately at this point in time there isn't a hundred percent clear answer but the things to consider is that you will have restricted um, abilities to control certain moving parts of of the different services just due to the nature of it being a large central tenant which will be centrally governed is is the primary piece to that hopefully that answers your question or feel free to obviously add some extra bits in there um, we had a few bits around presentation of applications so um, what would be, you know, kind of capabilities to present internal apps, like internal web apps? I think, Heinrich, you potentially might want to jump in and cover this one. Um, yeah, so uh, you've got a few good options in terms of presenting internal web apps. Um, and also then do your best to wrap around some additional security, like um, multi-factor authentication, as well as then um, conditional access. There's a, there's a service or a tool referred to as um, Azure App Proxy. Uh, which is a nice tool and that is a very good way for organizations to present out external or internal applications, typically web-based applications over to, um, to obviously end users or clinical staff, so to speak. So 
one of the more common scenarios we had to tackle um, with one other NHS organization is that um, they had um, lo lots and lots of nurses that would typically work within a sort of GP practice. Um, now being at home, taking calls over the phone to obviously do prescriptions and then leveraging some of that Azure App Proxy, we were able to make those um, sort of services and web applications available to the nurses in order to then obviously over the phone to be able to carry out um, your sort of assigning prescriptions. And the nice thing about that is as well, was that we were able to make that available across the sort of wide plethora of devices as well, uh, with sort of minimal overhead as well. Um, so we didn't need to manage that device, provided we had all the relevant bits and pieces in play from an Azure proxy perspective with multi-factor authentication and conditional access, we're able to sort of very quickly enable those healthcare professionals to obviously you know, carry on and do their jobs. Great, thank you for that. Um, another one would be around a bit of the VPN aspect. So um, setting VPN to exist in external devices. So essentially there's devices out there um, how would how would you get those onboarded to an existing? This is actually interesting, probably also for things like the the cloud management gateway um, elements there as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a really good point because I think that there was obviously that sort of quick fire response, obviously to get people back home or people just sort of staying at home following obviously the, um, the sort of recent COVID um, epidemic that we saw. So uh, there are a few ways of mitigating that. Um, naturally, users can naturally trickle into the office from a tr sort of traditional perspective and then receive the settings and bits and pieces from an always-on perspective organically. The alternative to that is if you have things like a cloud management gateway in place, as you alluded to earlier, Phil, um, if that connectivity back into your organization is possible, leveraging that particular technology set like configuration management, the cloud management gateway, you can go ahead and then apply the big thing for always on, which is certificates uh, to make sure that authentication happens to and fro between yourself and obviously that organization or the end user's device and the organization as well. Um, other ways of mitigating and meeting that is if that device is already part of an Intune setup as well, um, you can then remotely or should sort of um, obviously from a distance apply certain certificates and settings to turn that feature set on for always on connectivity as well. So there's a, there's a few ways and means um, of accessing that. We also, then there's also naturally sort of the uh, manual prevention as well if you can access that user's device through another way, through Teams or whatever the case may be. That's obviously a bit of a large, last ditch effort, um, but it is something we've had to deal with. And a lot of that was mitigated leveraging cloud management gateways with configuration manager where possible, as well as then things like Intune as well to go ahead and deploy a profile, but at the same time also make sure we've automated that process to get the certificates onto the device in the first place. Can I, sorry, Phil, can I just add to that as yeah. well? Um, one, one of the whole aspects or point of this is, is to reduce the requirement for a VPN. As you're moving your document set, as you're moving your apps, as you're moving everything to the cloud, the, the reliance and requirement for a VPN should be reduced heavily because people don't need to remote into one premises to get to their documents, to get to their, their workspaces. So, so that can reduce the, the overhead on that as well. Oh yeah, thank you for that, Chris. That's quite true as well. You know, helping to move towards a cloud orientated access, right? Um, actually, interesting on that, that that as well. There's a question around: Can you apply MAM on Windows 10 devices? So I can cover a bit of that off, and obviously feel free to jump in, guys, as well. But so interesting question: it, There is app protection policies. So an app protection policy is very similar to a, a mobile application management typical control that you'd apply to a to a you know iPhone or Android side, but it can be applied to specific collaboration apps at the moment so really it's the microsoft office profile for say windows 10 devices so you can introduce then a level of that um, uh, mobile application management control for uh, use on say windows 10 or, or other client devices as well so there is there is certainly some options there i don't know whether chris or Eric, you want to add to that in terms of any thoughts Uh, well, oh, one of the I you go, Chris. Sorry, go. Sorry, I, no, I, I, I jumped the gun. Um, you go. You go. <laughs> yeah, sorry. One of the, one of the products I mentioned when I come up there, Windows Information Protection Integration. The answer: Can you do it on a Windows 10 device uh, with application management? You can do it a lot easier on a Windows 10 device than you can do it on other devices. But there are uh, more options to be able to do it 
uh, with mobile application management, uh, with RMS, um, with um, reverse app proxy and Windows information protection integration as well on Windows devices. It does depend on the release of Windows 10 for some of those as well. But yes, you can do it is the quick answer. I think that's right. You'd agree when you have it. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah, um, you can also then use web or Windows information protection to protect apps on, on devices that aren't enrolled either. And she can do it just at the application layer naturally. Great. Um, a quick one then actually on the autopilot side. So so where does autopilot say not necessarily uh, work too well or, or how does it work with say things like an MDT, SCCM task sequence? Um, so I, I can I can maybe help with that. Um, so in, in terms of the sort of idea or the sort of reason for something like autopilot um, initially was obviously to get devices onboarded into an Azure Active Directory environment very, very quickly. Um, the actual service it stem, sort of self stemmed from the Windows Store for Business side and as I said was designed to get devices enrolled into your cloud services right very quickly. Um, Microsoft does say explicitly that there's it's a good idea to have a MDM. Um, I use the word MDM specifically because you don't have to have Intune to accomplish some of these uh, feature sets and capabilities. Um, so that is obviously a, a, a sort of large consideration to make as well. Um, secondly, then where where autopilot absolutely fall short in in terms of expectations, because you're quite right, Phil. There was some initial sort of I would argue confusion as to the what it's capable of. Um, is to take you from Windows 7 to Windows 10. Um, you need to already be on Windows 10 um, and it's designed effectively speaking for you to purchase devices or use existing devices on Windows 10 to then uplift that and onboard that into cloud services predominantly. Um, you're quite right, there are definite capabilities now to join those devices to both your Azure Active Directory on-premise environment as well as then your um, traditional Active Directory environment as well. That hybrid join um, is something we're seeing leveraged heavily. The other thing where it is very good at or a sort of very good thing to use is that scenario basically how power on platforms works so to speak so uh, we have the luxury of i can purchase a device i give a hardware hash to someone i log on and i can just get working so it is designed to speed things up the rationale was you already are on windows 10 why rip windows 10 off through a traditional task sequence to put windows 10 back on um, that was, I think, obviously part of the big rationale around bit, sort of the uh, device build side of things. And then with Windows Autopilot, the idea there being is you join that device to your cloud services, and MDM then takes over to configure the already existing operating system to your company's liking or preference for compliance reasons, for security reasons, and so on as well. And it also then reduces the dependency for a on-premise infrastructure in order to mitigate and manage those devices, especially if you're looking to get devices ready for the first time anyway. It's designed to free IT up as well. Okay, great. Um, actually, just an uh, interesting question came in around just linked to the one of the previous answers. Um, talking about moving files, apps to the Azure cloud, uh, the question would be around where the assurance is that Azure Microsoft Cloud products are secure for personal data. Is, is that as a reason many look to a VPN? You have some thoughts on that mark and heinrich sorry chris and heinrich i do apologize well yeah of course um so um moving your file structure uh, into the cloud the the, the microsoft cloud uh, be it sharepoint or your onedrive for business is again is absolutely gdbr compliant um there is this um fear if you like that, okay, we're losing control of our files, we're moving our files up, we have, um, it's mentioned some of the products there, compliance manager and so on, which actually makes it easier to make sure you are achieving, um, whether it be um, NCSC recommendations or GDPR compliance or, or um, any of the ISOs that are out there that, that makes it easier to receive these. You, you kind of, to put it in a simple thing, the cloud where we talk about the cloud is is in a, is in a essence another data center it is a data center that's run by by microsoft that has to follow the same laws rules and regulations the data is stored within the uk we do still and always will follow gdpr there are um 250 governing bodies 
um, around the world that we have to follow all those regulations for, not just GDPR, although I would say GDPR is probably one of the more stringent ones. Um, and there's about 700 new regulations come out every day that Microsoft has, has to make sure we, we implement and we adhere to. There are some when we go to a cloud-based model, it depends how far you go into it. There are some things that Microsoft are responsible for, and there are some things that you are responsible for. So depending on whether you go from information as a service, right, platform as a service, or software as a service, there's always going to be a limit that we are responsible, for example, for implementing controls on your data that you stipulate. So you stipulate um, Dr. A can access this data. Now we are responsible for implementing those controls that you stipulate, but you are responsible for stipulating what Dr. A can access. Only, only you can stipulate that. So I understand the concerns around that, but it's very much um, we're fully observant of any rules and regulations that may need to be applied to your documentation. Yeah, I think it's a good point as well that you make on the last note as well that there's 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 definitely that kind of point of clarity between where the responsibilities lie as well. I think I think you say well there in terms of Microsoft is essentially providing a, a very secure platform in essence, like considerations of an alternative to an on-premise infrastructure or otherwise. Um, but there's just as if you were on an on-premise infrastructure, you're still responsible for the control mechanisms you put onto the specific items that exist within it. That's no different in a in a Microsoft service as well. You know, there, there's a lot though of options, capability, support, and, and as, as Chris has said, there's a wide range of stuff that Microsoft has provided to make that easier. So the ability to achieve kind of secure data is far more um, achievable on a Microsoft cloud than I would say alternative to it. I do appreciate that there is, of course, always considerations when moving to a point that's outside of your, your core direct um, physical control. Um, but, you know, uh, the regulatory rigor that is put through for those services really does kind of provide um you know that kind of support to ensure a lot of that for it but you must consider though you still have the responsibility to ensure that you've you have set your internal governance and policies that allows you to comply with your own data principles as it were uh, relevant to that but the supporting mechanisms you have are, are pretty wide ranging yeah, just to add to that as well, it, it's something that gets discussed quite often um, and it can sometimes translate to where does my data reside? Is that location secure? Um, to your point as well, from a Microsoft perspective, I, I do agree. I think they've done an excellent job in making sure that things are secure from that perspective. Organizations can also add to that as well. If we talk about files, for example, like we, we discussed Azure Information Protection earlier. Um, so the sort of security landscape, um, as well as then the perspective and the view of how data is protected is slightly changing. So we're looking at, you can encrypt individual files with quite comprehensive audit trails as well, um, should something go skew if or to the left or to the right as well, right? Um, obviously then complemented by the wider EMNS stack for sort of greater levels of control. I think all bolsters that entire security message beyond just the Azure regulatory and compliance side, but also all the way down to actually that PDF over there is protected and four people can access it and only those four as well. Um, so yeah, it, it's a, it's a well-rounded security footprint at the moment. It, it is a much more, and, and, and yes, absolutely agree with all that, but it's a much more in-depth conversation that um, I'm willing to have and go into detail around compliance, about information protection, uh, and that conversation as well, and, and, and just as Heinrich was saying, where we're talking about labeling, retention labels, and applying policies, and, and, and making sure not just that we protect this data, but we also monitor it and make sure you know we can monitor who's doing what, with what, and to whom, and whether or not just if that data is on premise and uh, or in your cloud, but when that data moves outside of your control as well, there's still the ability to have rights management on that data when it's beyond your control. Great, uh, thank you for that. Just just being conscious of time, and I put it, I took a bit too much of time, but um, a few more questions, and then obviously if there's any last ones you wanna throw in, please do throw them in. But essentially one was around the um, cloud management gateway for distribution of content. So I, I mentioned there that 
you know, traditionally, um, this is an option that people have implemented very quickly to be able to do patches and software distribution. But you, you can use it to distribute out um, Windows operating system uh, task sequence sides. The, the the main consideration for that is this won't do what would be referred to typically as a bare metal, but it'll do what I tend to refer to as an OS initiated or a or a wipe and load um, scenario for it. So it'll run it from the OS. It'll provision all the content down, so you can pre-provision all the content to the device, and then essentially run that full operating system deployment task sequence so that can be wiping the existing device cleaning it all um, up basically then removal of the windows 7 and placement of the windows 10 uh, you know all various other scenarios as well it doesn't have to necessarily just be about getting from 7 to 10 uh, but it does give you quite a nice range of opportunities that is from um just trying to remember off the top of my head now whether it's 1902 or is it 1906 um, it is from a specific variant of the um, version of configuration manager that you're running that starts to bring in that task sequence. But if you're on, I'm pretty sure it's 906 upwards, but I'll, I'll, I'll confirm if that's incorrect. Um, but if you're on the later versions of the current branch configuration of config manager, you do have that options for you. So it can be a quite a nice uh, capability just to, to bring some options for you in the short term uh, as well around that. Um, I think just one final question, just looking at which one we potentially pick. Um, so one interesting question, uh, just because there's always a bit of confusion around this, is does Config Manager and Intune need to be integrated to provide modern management? Uh, Heinrich, I don't know whether you want to kind of cover that one off or I can jump in. Uh, no, <clears throat> doesn't. Um, you, it, it's recommended, ball stretch, um, but in terms of modern management, it, it typically refers to cloud native capabilities. So Microsoft can endpoint configuration manager um, is the answer for that, right? So it does a very good job across the sort of holistic integration between all of the various product sets we spoke about today. Um, but you can keep them completely isolated or separated should you choose. Um, there's nothing stopping you from doing that. Um, recommendations around that would be to make sure that you uh, have your configuration manager environment managing what you want it to manage. It does a very good job at still traditional on-premise type management with then your in-tune side of things for you know more mobile workers, consultants, GPs, practices, nurses out and about, um, and so on as well, right? So you can have that split, um, but obviously between the two. You can also then do like um, sort of sort of bias workloads if you did want to integrate them as well. So you have a bias towards configuration manager does my inventory and my application deployments, but I'm quite happy for Intune to patch indiscriminately um, across the following devices or out and about. So you can have that split brain model, right? In order to obviously accomplish that. All of those things combined from a sort of cloud perspective, from an Azure perspective, an EMS perspective, equates to um, modern management um, but there's no hard stop on must have sort of needing to actually have a must have between integration between intune and configuration manager you can keep them apart should you desire great all right thank you for that i think um as we're approaching time um if there's any additional questions that anyone would like or will get uh, answers out then we'll we'll certainly follow up from that um but just then to to kind of essentially close out the kind of session um effectively we've given it a lot of information today but also we've only really skimmed the surface of an awful lot um of course you've got the september time frame to get your kind of licensing in places and potentially there's some needs if you do have any questions or if there's anything you know you'd actually like to say can we really get maybe a one-on-one -on -one to dive into a bit more detail on this or if there's other information that you feel you'd actually like us to do more of a specific technical dive into then do feel free to share that we can run those as additional sessions like this for groups or or otherwise but also very happy to have a kind of a one-to-one -one conversation we do appreciate that this has actually been a, a longer normal webinar than than most so we appreciate the time that you spent and we really do hope that you have found this informative and useful Again, just to say, please do get in touch. More than happy to kind of uh, provide knowledge and, and information. Um, but essentially, we'd like to thank Chris and Heinrich for the session today. Uh, and obviously, thank all of you again for attending. And that is all from us. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Great.